every page in the Quran you cannot help but notice an explicit or implicit reference to the concept of fearing Allah Jalla Jalaluh. It is an empowering fear, don't get me wrong. And I will mention that in the end of this particular segment. But first of all, let us establish there is a concept called Khashiyatullah, the fear of Allah Jalla Jalaluh. And let it displease whomever it displeases. We love Allah. And we yearn for the nearness to Allah. And we have hope in the mercy of Allah. And we also fear the wrath of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu Al-Malik. We do. And there are two terms in the Arabic that are usually used to denote fear. What are they? One of them is? Huh? Khawf. And then? Khashya. And there is a whole host of other words as well. Let's just focus on these two famous ones. Khawf. Fear. Khashya, also translated as fear. So in the translation, it's not really captured, i.e. the difference between them. There is a big difference, however. And we are required to have both. Khawf of Allah and khashiyatullah, but one is more superior than the other. Khawf, we know what that is. It's the sense of terror or dread or apprehension that comes into your heart when, when you make contact with the object of fear. Khawf, fear. As for khashya, this is a fear that is maqroonatun bi ma'rifah. It is mixed with profound knowledge. Khawf is fear, but is not necessarily mixed with the knowledge of the object of fear. Khashia, on the other hand, is fear. The same level of apprehension, right? But what is different is that it is mixed with a deeper understanding, profound knowledge, ilm and ma'rifah. And that is why when Allah, he praised the people of knowledge, did he say they had khawf of Allah? Or did he say they had khashia of Allah? He said, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء it is the scholars who have khashya of Allah. He didn't say khawf. It is the scholars, the people of knowledge, who have khashya of Allah because that fear is mixed with knowledge. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Inni atqaakum lillahi wa ashaddukum lahu khashya. I am the one who has the most piety from you all. And my khashya of him is the greatest. Why is his khashya the greatest? Because no one knew Allah Almighty more than our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So khashya is a fear that is mixed with knowledge. And that is why you see the reactions of two people who are afraid, different. If this one has khawf and this one has khashya, they fear the same object. But their reactions are different because their levels of knowledge are different. And I give an example. There may be two individuals who are afflicted with the same illness. One of them is a doctor who knows the ins and outs of this disease, and the other one is just a, a layman, or let's call him a non-doctor. They're both afraid. They're both afraid because they both want to live. However, the one who has khawf, the lesser form of fear, his reaction isn't necessarily a composed one. It's a question of looking to grab anything, panicking, Asking people, meltdown, I don't know what to do, because he wants to live. Whereas the reaction of the doctor who has khashya, the deeper level of fear, don't get me wrong, he has the same level of terror and dread. He also doesn't want to die. But his reaction is what? It's a lot more efficient. It's a lot more effective. Because he's trained. And therefore he knows what he needs to do and what not to do to get himself outside of the boundaries of this illness. And that's the difference between a Muslim who has khawf of Allah, which is a praiseworthy station, and another who has khashya of Allah Jalla Jalla. Fear with knowledge. He knows how to get out of the anger of Allah Jalla Jalla. He knows how to find the pleasure of Allah Jalla Jalla. So that's one of the differences between khawf and khashya. What is the difference, brothers? Remind me. Khawf is fear and khashya is Fear mixed with profound knowledge. Good. There is a second difference, which is that khashya 
is a fear مع الإجلال والهيبة والتعظيم خشية is a fear that is mixed with awe and glorification and a sense of reverence to the object of fear so when you have خوف of something the level lower of fear you may revere it, you may not, you may glorify it, you may not if, however, you have khashya of something, you definitely glorify it. You are afraid. There is apprehension. But it's mixed with haiba, jalal, azama, reverence. Oh, you're impressed. Deep admiration. You're in a state of awe. That's a difference between the two. Therefore, if you are running away from, let's call him an armed robber, you have khawf. Fear, but you don't have khashya of him because you don't glorify him. There's no awe of him. There's nothing special about him. I'm just running for my life. Right? Khashya. Oh, khawf. When, however, you run away from Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, you run away from Allah to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu because you revere him, you admire him, you glorify him. So we call this khashya. A fear that is mixed with reverence and glorification and haiba, awe. Of something, and that is, of course, exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, we ask the same question here how do we uh, foster this khawf? Because I want to come into my salah now with the state of hope in Allah Jalla Jalal and excitement, but also I mustn't forget the other side of the spectrum. I, am, I fear my Lord. And here, a quick footnote someone may ask, Are these not contradictory? Can they coexist? Can I love and have hope in someone, but also fear them? And the, of course, the answer is yes, it's, it's possible. They're not mutually exclusive. They can coexist. And I give you an example. Imagine that you are in debt to someone financially, but the lender happens to be a merciful person, an individual with good characteristics. So on one hand, there is a apprehension, there is a fear. You acknowledge that you owe the money. There's no getting out of it. It has to be paid back. But on the, the same vein, there is hope. Because of his good traits, he will forgive. He will pardon. He will drop the debt. So it's possible. They can coexist. Come into your salah with raja, hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your heart and your mind and your hands spread out. But similarly, you come into your prayer recognizing whom it is that you are sharing a space with now. And that is Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And you, you have khashya of him. You fear him. How do we go about fostering this khashya of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu? And we say the exact same thing we said about Raja. That is by knowing Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's why he said, I know Allah Almighty the most and I fear him the most. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, because it is knowledge that is the vehicle that takes a person to the khashya of Allah Jalla Jalla, by knowing him, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you read a hadith, subhanallah al azim which Abu Dawood narrates on the authority of Jabir, that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, describing the physical properties of just one of the angels, Carrying the throne of Allah Jalla Jalla. He said, Udhina li an uhaditha an malakin min malaikati hamalati al arsh. Permission has been given to me to describe to you, O Muslims, one of the angels who is carrying the throne of Allah Jalla Jalla. And how many are they? Wa yahmilu arsh rabbika fawqahum yawma idhin thamaniya. There's eight of them. Permission has been given to me to describe the physical properties of just one of those angels. He said, مَا بَيْنَ شَحْمَةِ أُذُنِهِ إِلَىٰ عَاتِقِهِ مَسِيرَةُ سَبْعِ The distance between his earlobe and his shoulder. How much was that on mine? Bearing in mind, I've got a quite a above average neck. It's a little bit on the long side. <laughs> it's not more than 10 centimeters or so. He said the distance between the earlobe of this angel and his shoulder is the distance of 700 years worth of travel. So if this is the distance, 
between his earlobe to his shoulder, what then of the size, the full size of this angel? And if this is the size of one of those eight angels, what about all eight of those angels? And if this is the magnificence, magnificence and size and enormity of angels who are carrying the throne of Allah, what then of the Adama, the might and the glory of the Arsh, the throne itself? And if, it's, if this is the enormity and the magnificence of the throne itself, what then do you make of the Lord of the throne, Allah Rabbul Arsh al Majid? You read a narration like this, what happens? Instantly your heart is filled with awe and reverence and glory and fear of this Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, a Lord of might and kibriya. Sovereignty is His, kingdom is His. His supremacy is His, ownership is His, dominance is His, His wealth belongs to Allah, kingdom belongs to Allah, authority belongs to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. He is the Lord of sovereignty and dominion and He is the Lord of unbreakable might. This is not a Lord to be disobeyed. You want to know about Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, look at how He dealt with some of those perished nations of the past who went against their Lord and challenged their prophets and messengers. When you read about the story of the Prophet of Allah, Nuh Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who spent about a thousand years giving da'wah to his people in an act of mercy from Allah Almighty and patience from that Prophet, yet they mocked him, they violently opposed him, they challenged him. So he called upon Allah Almighty for help and Allah would not let him down. What was the outcome? An ancient apocalypse. A cataclysmic event, the like of which this world has never seen. What happened? Allah said, we opened up the heavens as if they were gates, bringing down torrents of rain. And we caused the earth to erupt with springs. Therefore, the rain of the heavens would meet the rain of the earth to carry out a matter that Allah has already decided. You had the remorseless floods reaching the peaks of mountains, destroying every civilization. According to the majority of the scholars, it was a flood that engulfed the entire globe. And what was the outcome? Allah said, away with the wrongdoing people. This is Allah Jalla Jalal. This is a law to be challenged or disobeyed, subhanAllah. Worthy of khashya, come into your salah with this mindset. Then many years after the death of Prophet Nuh, alayhi salatu wasalam, another civilization would rise to power. They were called the people of Ad. And they were powerful. They were people of physical prowess. And they knew it. And they would say, Man ashaddu minna quwa. Who is more powerful than us? And so Allah sent to them the Prophet of Allah, Hud, to correct their crooked ways. And they mocked him. And they laughed at him. And they rejected him and violently opposed him. So he raised his hands to Allah, Al-Malik, the Sovereign, the King of Kings. And Allah did not let him down. And what was the outcome? The people of Ad. The uh, Atlantis of the sand dunes, the people of the Ahqaf, as the Quran calls them, who lived in a place between Hadramaut of Yemen and Oman in modern day Saudi. What was the outcome? Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi'ad. Allah asks, Have you not seen what your Lord did to the people of Ad? La ilaha illallah. What did Allah do to them? As for the people of Ad, we unleashed upon them a furious, roaring, howling wind. That was set upon them for seven nights. And eight days, continuously, non-stop. So you see the people now lying dead. Looking like trunks of palm trees that have been uprooted from the land. So do you see any remnants of them today? Allah says. 
you read a story like that, you realize this is a law to be feared. That's a law to be revered, glorified. And that is the Lord who you stand before when you say Allahu Akbar and you begin your salat. Fear that trepidation in your heart. And then many years after the perishing of the people of Ad rose to power another civilization. Their name was Thamud. And the archaeologists differ as per where they actually lived. Some people they say in Petra in Jordan, others they say in parts of Saudi Arabia, and others they say it's a mix between both, with one capital being in one of those two cities. But what non-Muslim archaeologists know for sure, that it was a devastating natural event, as they call it, that ended the civilization of the people of Thamud. And they became arrogant. And so the Prophet of Allah Saleh was sent to them by Allah Jalla Jalaluhu to correct their crooked ways. And they mocked him. They said, bring us a miracle. So he made dua and a she-camel was produced for them. They hamstrung, hamstrung the she-camel. And they challenged their Lord and they said, bring us the punishment that you threaten us of. And so Saleh, he said to them, Enjoy your time in your homes for another three days. This is a promise of Allah that cannot be belied. Something is coming. And when those 72 hours pass by, the heavens filled with thunderbolts, and the earth beneath them began to quake, and there was a terrible scream, a screeching from the, sc from the sky that took out the very last of them. And the outcome, Ala بُعْدًا لثمود, Away with the people of Thamud, Allah said. That's the end of that civilization. So when you read something like this, what happens? It fosters khashya, fear of Allah Jalla Jalla. And you realize that this is not a law to be disobeyed. Travel the world. Travel the world. See the ruins of ancient civilizations and perished nations. And you will come to the conclusion, La malika wa la malika illa Allah. There is no king and owner but Allah. Every one of them has been dethroned. Go to the city of Babylon and the ruins of Babylon in Iraq. Go to the Parthenon of Greece and go to the Roman Colosseum of Italy and go to the pyramid structures of Egypt and the sophisticated stone structures of Petra in Jordan and you will see one message, one signature ingrained in all of those civilizations and that signature says, لا غالب إلا الله There is no conqueror but Allah. There is no victor but Allah Jalla Jalla. Every one of them dethroned and sent to their graves. This is a law to be feared, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is not a law to be disobeyed. So it is by knowing Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Knowing him through the universal signs that you see around you. Looking into the heavens to know Allah. Unzuru madha fi samawati wal ard. Allah said, look at what is in the heavens and the earth. Allah said, أَوَلَمْ يَنْظُرُوا فِي مَلَكُوتِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Have they not looked into the dominions of the heavens and the earth? وَمَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And all things that Allah has created. You look at that, it increases you in love of Allah, hope in Allah, but it also increases you in fear and glory of Allah. He is not a Lord to be disobeyed. That's why I say, brothers, really, and sisters, on a quick side note here, just because there is some silence and normality to your life after you've committed a particular sin, beware of thinking that Allah Almighty did not see it. And beware of thinking that this is a sign and an indication for you to continue because nothing is going to happen. And that is why Al Mutanabbi, one of the poets, he said, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ النُّيُوبَ اللَّيْثِ بَارِزَةً فَلَا تَظُنَنَّ أَنَّ اللَّيْثَ يَبْتَسِمُ he said, if you see the canine teeth of a lion presenting themselves to you, beware of thinking that the lion is smiling at you. He's not smiling at you. Similarly, if your life post sin is silence, normality, and I don't see no thunderbolts, and I don't see no cancer developing in my body, I don't see no immediate punishment, beware of misinterpreting this as a sign from Allah Almighty to say to you, go ahead, continue, everything is okay. No, everything is not okay. Because at the second in time, Allah is treating you with His Rahmah, with His forbearance, with His Hilm, with His kindness, 
But should our behavior continue, that may change. Our Lord is one to be feared. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what I'm talking about, khashya, to know Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, to study about what will happen in the grave. And maybe some of you saw that video that went viral not too long ago. Some Australian uh, Muslim brothers who took with them a parrot to a graveyard. Now, I, I don't know if this is true or if it is not, but it looked very moving. And we know that all of creation hear the punishment of the grave with the exception to human beings and the jinn. Everything else listens. They can hear what happens underground. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that whenever the donkeys used to have constipation back in his days, they would take them to the graveyards of the kuffar and instantly they would have diarrhea because they would hear and that would bring everything out, la ilaha illallah. So uh, they bring this parrot to, the, to a graveyard of non-Muslims, it seems, and it, it, it's, it's, its feathers are all perked up and it's singing and it looks very jolly and happy and then the moment they bring it into the graveyard all of its feathers come down and there is a sense of khushu' actually upon it sakina it's just it, it's clearly disturbed and then it begins to make the sounds as if mimicking what it can hear people who are screaming people who are in agony and pain Anyway, the idea is to have khashya of Allah Almighty and to realize He is a Lord to be feared. So, to know Allah Almighty, this is one way. The second way, and I will conclude with this, of developing this khashya of Allah, is to know people who have khashya of Allah. Or to at least mix with their biographies and read about their lives. You will begin to feel something happening in your heart. And by the way, those who have khashya of Allah are not just human beings. They are angels, and they are stones, and they are mountains. They all fear Allah Jalla Jalaluh. Allah Almighty said about rocks. Then your hearts became hard after that. Then your hearts became like rocks or even harder. وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْحِجَارَةِ لَمَا يَتَفَجَّرُ مِنْهُ الْأَنْهَارِ And there are some rocks that burst open with rivers. وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَشَّقَّقُ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ الْمَاءِ And there are some rocks that split open and water come from them. وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَهْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ And there are some rocks that fall from the khashya, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah Almighty tells us about the Malaika, the angels. They fear their Lord who is above them. Allah said about the angels, They stand in awe and fear of Allah. The Prophet saw Angel Jibreel, who is the most magnificent and favored and dignified angel of Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu, who is of a beautiful creation. 600 wings when he saw him in his true angelic form. Each one of those wings filling the horizons, covering the open sky as far as you can see, 600 of them. And pearls and rubies falling out from the eight wings of this angel, the magnificence of which only Allah Almighty knows. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said when he saw angel Jibreel in his true form. Yet that very angel when he was with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, ascending into the heavens, making their way to their Lord, our Messenger وسلم, looks at Angel Jibreel as they were reaching the highest abode. And he said, And Jibreel, he said, looked like a worn out saddle cloth from the fear of Allah. Mighty angel looked like a, a worn-out saddle cloth from the fear and humbleness before Allah Jalla Jalalu. Angels had this khashi of Allah and the rocks, they had this khashi of Allah. And as for our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was the Imam of Khashiyah, never in his life was he seen laughing hysterically. Now, this may be different for you and I, and it certainly was different to some of the companions they did, who would fall on their backs laughing hysterically. Hey, we're human. But as for him, alayhi salatu wasalam, his, his self, our mother Aisha, she said, 
ما رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ضاحكا مستجمعا قط حتى تظهر لهواته Never in my life did I see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam laughing in a way whereby you could see his uvula. The uvula is the name of the fleshy structure at the back of the throat. You see it dangling. He said never did he laugh in a way where it could be seen. He never laughed hysterically. He would simply smile. And he was a man who was always smiling, but he did not laugh hysterically. She said, and whenever clouds or wind would blow in Medina, we would see fear in his face. And he would be in and out of the house, in and out of the house. He was afraid. And our mother Aisha, she questioned him on this. She confronted him and said, how is it that when the wind blows and the clouds gather, we're all happy because we hope for rain. Except you, we see fear in your face. And he said to her, Ya Aisha, to oh Aisha, مَا يُؤَمِّنُنِي أَنْ يَكُونَ فِيهِ عَذَابٍ How can I be sure that there is not a punishment in that cloud? قَدْ عُذِّبَ قَوْمٌ بِالْرِيحِ There was a nation before us who were destroyed with wind. وَقَدْ رَآ قَوْمٌ الْعَذَابَ فَقَالُوا هَذَا عَارِضٌ مُمْطِرُنَا And there was another nation who saw clouds forming and they said, this is a cloud bringing us rain. It was a punishment. What is this but khashiyah of Allah Jalla Jalalu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And then I share with you some statements of our predecessors. I read these statements in Ibn Abi Dunya's book called Al-Mutamannin, meaning those who made wishes. He basically collates in his book statements of the Salaf who made wishes. They had hopes for things. And I've picked out for you a few to show you their khashiyah of Allah Jalla Jalalu. You have the like of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu who said, Ya laytani shajaratun tu'adadu fatu'kal. I wish I was just a tree that would be cut down and people would use its wood. And that would be the end of it. I wish I was a tree. And Umar radiallahu anhu would say, يَا لَيْتَنِي هَذِهِ التِّبْنَةِ I wish I was this stick of hay. يَا لَيْتَ أُمِّي لَمْ تَلِدْنِي I wish my mother never gave birth to me. يَا لَيْتَنِي كُنْتُ نَسْيًا مَنْسِيًّا I wish I was something forgotten. يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَكُوْ شَيْئًا I wish I was nothing. Why did they say these things? Because they know now that they are not nothing, now that they are human beings, they have a soul, it means they are created for eternity. If you're created for eternity, it means there is a resurrection and there's no guarantee of passing. We wish we were trees, we wish we were hay, we wish we were boulders, we wish we were an inanimate object so that there will be no standing before Allah and no, and no accountability. Khashiyah of Allah they had, subhanAllah. And Umar, he would say, لَوْ أَنَّ لِي طِلَاعَ الْأَرْضِ ذَهَبًا لَفْتَدَيْتُ بِهِ مِنْ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ أَرَاهِ If I had the earth's fill of gold, I would use it to ransom myself from the punishment of Allah before I meet him. And these are the words coming from a man who was promised Jannah. And when he was passing away, his head was on the lap of his son, Abdullah. He was breathing his last. And then he said to his son, place my head on the floor. He said, my father, just keep it on my lap. He said, place it on the floor. He said, my father, the, the floor on my lap, they're the same. He said, just place my head on the floor so that Allah may see me with the eye of mercy. And he placed his head on the floor. And there, his last words before he died were, Waili wa waylu ummi illam yarhamni rabbi. Woe to me and woe to my mother if Allah does not have mercy upon me. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he would say, Ya laytani idha mittu anni lam ubath. I wish that if I die, I would not be resurrected. And Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, another companion, he would say, Ya laytani labina min hadha labin la li wa la alay. I wish I was one of those rocks in the wall, nothing for me and nothing against.